Today, we're going to be talking about three reasons why people get distracted from their purpose and how to keep from it using what Jesus taught us on Palm Sunday. So before we do that, if you'll just go ahead and grab your Bible and say this after me. I thank you, Father, Father, that your word word has the power power to change my life. life. Today, I give heed to it. I I allow it to go into my ears ears, and into my mind mind, and then into my spirit. spirit. I am a hearer of the word and a doer of the word. And I will never be the same after today in Jesus name amen you may be seated have you ever known that you were supposed to do something but then you lost your way along the way to that something or sometimes you even forget what it is it could be something small like how many of you have ever went to a room to get something And then when you got there, you couldn't remember what it was. If you have ever done that, make me feel better and say, that's me. Yeah. Or it could be something mundane, but very, very important, like your taxes by tomorrow. (laughs) Somebody just panicked. (laughs) Or it could be something big, like being a great spouse or a great parent or studying for that big test filling out those, those college applications, or it could even be your very calling, what God has placed you on this earth to do, what God placed in your heart to be. And so today, I'm not talking about how to find your purpose. I talked about that a few months ago, and you can find that teaching on our website. But today, I want to talk about why people lose their purpose. You know, it's hard enough for us to discover why we're on this earth to begin with. But for some reason, it seems to be equally hard to be focused on it, to not get distracted, to not forget about the reason for our very existence. We find ourselves in survival mode a lot of times, the same old, same old. And the painful part of it is that a life with no purpose is no life at all. And we all know this, and yet we still struggle to keep our eye on our purpose. You see, I know what it's like to have a purpose and a calling, and then somewhere along the way, I lose my focus on that very purpose and calling. I know what it's like to have a goal and a vision and a purpose that I'm sure of, that I'm intent on, something that I knew I was supposed to accomplish, something that I was excited about. But then it just gets drowned out by all of life's worries and cares and distractions and have-tos. I'm not sure, but I'm thinking maybe I'm not alone here. So if you've ever experienced any of this, if you'll once again make me feel better and say I have. have. Thank you. (laughs) Sometimes when life happens to us, it's easy to lose our way back to the road that we were supposed to be on, on all along. We become distracted and discouraged or, and even depressed because what we were supposed to do now seems so far away. But don't worry because we're not alone. Check this out. The most popular Bible verse on the Bible study web tools website is Jeremiah 29.11. And it says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And it's the second most popular Bible verse on the Bible Gateway website. Now, the third most popular verse on Bible Gateway is this. It is Romans 8, 28. It says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so out of the 10 most popular Bible verses on Bible Gateway, more than half of them have themes of purpose and meaning. And so I believe that God placed a longing for purpose and meaning on the inside of each and every one of us. And 
as it turns out, this longing is reflected in the Bible verses that we turn to most often. So today is Palm Sunday. And the story of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem reveals to us how he overcame the same problems that we have. And so he had what had to be an overwhelming temptation to get distracted from his purpose. He had everything against him. And so I just want to unpack some of the truths from this last week of his humanity here on earth so that we can make sure to stay focused on our purpose just like he was able to. So today we're going to read the story of the triumphant entry and we're going to read it from Luke, the gospel of Luke. Now, Palm Sunday's events are some of the few events that tend to jump off the pages of scripture. So there are, so there's 89 chapters in the four gospels. The three of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. Soon is a preposition in Greek meaning with, and then optic, it means to see. So they see with or see together. That's what that means is that these three gospels are seeing with each other. So if you go through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's almost like you don't even know what book you're in other than some stylistic things. They, it's, it's almost like they're pretty much hovering like a little trio following Jesus and the stories that were there. Now, John, you kind of wonder where he was. He doesn't even cover the same stuff. It's almost like, wow. I mean, I don't know. He saw other things. But those together make the portrait that God wants us to see. And so when you look at what events are in all four, and there aren't very many, but this is one of them. But whenever whenever you, there are very few events in the life of Christ that all four gospels writers record. And when you bump into one, it's kind of like, you know, if everywhere you go, every television set, if, if every channel is having the same broadcast, it's kind of like you probably need to stop and, and pay attention. There's something serious that's going on. Something's happening if everybody's looking at it. So when all four gospels align at the same event, then we need to pay attention And so this is when Jesus comes as the promised lamb of God who presents himself as the king, which he is, and he comes into Jerusalem on the time period when the Passover lamb was being selected to be slain by individual families for their sacrifice for Passover. Exactly when Christ was crucified. So listen, he actually came into town with the rest of the lambs in order to present himself as the Lamb of God. It's pretty interesting. But today, I want to pick Luke's gospel to read the triumphant entry from. And so let's look at this. He tells his disciples, he tells them to go into the city and that they will find a colt tied there or a donkey that no one had ever ridden. So he says, grab it and bring it to me. And if anybody asks you, why are you taking it? Just tell them the Lord needs it. Could you imagine being that guy? (laughs) Be like me just rolling up into your yard and hijacking your car. And you ask me, hey, what are you doing? And I'm like, God needs it. And I drive off. I, I, anyway, let, let's look in Luke. So in chapter 19 and verse 33, it says, but as they were loosening the colt, the owners of it said to them, what, what we would all say, what are you doing with my colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And then the next verse says that they brought him to Jesus. So, you know what, side question, uh, what kind of fight went down between verse 30, 34 and 35? I don't know. But anyway, so they got the colt and it says that they threw their own clothes on the colt and they sat Jesus on him. And as they went, they, uh, many spread their clothes on the road. And then as he was drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen saying blessed is the king who comes in the name of the lord peace in heaven and glory in the highest and some of the pharisees called to him from the crowd teacher rebuke your disciples 
But he answered to them and said, I tell you, if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now, so then, and this is really interesting too. In verse 41, it says, Now as he drew near to the city, he saw the city and he wept over it. And then it goes on to say that he was heartbroken because of, when he looked over the city, the same people that were crying Hosanna and that were rejoicing now would later be screaming, crucify him. So we're going to talk about why later. But Jesus has this very distinct calling and very distinct purpose. And he's going to Jerusalem for a specific reason and purpose. He knows, and he's been revealing it to his disciples, that he will be beaten and killed and raised again. So he has this this very laser-like focus and commitment and direction in his life at this moment. And he has all these things that go on. And so what I'd like to do is back up and kind of unpack this a little bit for us. You see, the reason that all of these people are crying out and rejoicing is because they think that Jesus is going to deliver them from the Romans. You see, all the Jewish people at this point were under Roman occupation at this time. And what's interesting is that in all of Jesus' teachings... And then everything that happened, you can see glimpses of the fact of that they thought that the Messiah that was prophesied to come and deliver the Jews, that he was going to deliver the Jews from their physical captors, the Romans. And when you read the words of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, he never leads them to believe anything different. See, if you had the mindset that Jesus was there to deliver the Jews from the Romans, a physical revolt, and you read all of Jesus' teachings, none of it would contradict that assumption. See, Jesus said things like, trade in your cloak for a sword. And then there were also, there were, there were two different times that Jesus fed the multitudes. The first, it says that there were women and children there. Thousands of women and children along with the men. But the second time was directly after the Romans beheaded John the Baptist. And so after the Romans beheaded John, it says that 5,000 men showed up at Jesus' feet. And so we have to wonder, were they there saying, hey, I mean, did they have their weapons? Did they, did they show up and say, hey, they killed the Baptist. It's time to do this thing. We need to take care of the Romans. And so Jesus teaches them, feeds them, and sends them home. And I imagine they were pretty confused by that. But this is also why Judas betrayed Jesus. See, the Bible says that Judas betrayed Jesus for a very small amount of money. And see, Judas was Jesus' treasurer. So Jesus had enough money that he needed a treasurer. It wasn't like he had a few quarters in his pocket. And he had enough money in the treasury that his treasurer could steal money from the bag and nobody noticed. So Judas did not betray Jesus for a small amount of money. Judas was trying to force Jesus' hand because he believed what everybody else believed, which was that Jesus was here to deliver the Jews from the Romans and set up a new kingdom. This is why they're all fighting over who gets to be greatest in the kingdom. They're, they're thinking that it's this kingdom, this kingdom, this physical kingdom Jesus is setting up. So all these people on Palm Sunday are shouting Hosanna and glory to God in the highest. And they're quoting Old Testament Psalms and scriptures and prophecies. And they believe that Jesus is going to set up an earthly kingdom. This is why when everything seems to go south, they all turn on him because they were confused. They didn't understand. And this is something else that's very interesting. All of these things that Jesus did in the triumphant entry go back to examples of what kings and conquerors would do. See, kings and conquerors being welcomed into the, into the cities during the Hellenistic and Roman periods, including Spartan generals, Alexander the Great, and many other great conquerors, that what they would do is they would come into a city, they would ride into the city being pulled by horses so that everybody could celebrate their victory. 
And so this was symbolic to them. They thought that this was Jesus coming and claiming that he was going to be delivering them from the Romans. That's why the religious leaders got angry and told him to tell them to be quiet. So Jesus picks a colt or a donkey which had to be kind of maybe humorous to the Romans, who, you know, because the symbolism of the donkey um, could, in the Eastern traditions, were that it was an animal of peace versus the horse, which was an animal of war. And so the symbolism of the donkey contradicted what they were expecting of Jesus. And yet, they totally missed it. Now, also, they had palm branches. And although Luke only records that they put their clothes down, the other gospels record that they're, they also laid down palm branches. Now, the, in the Roman culture that had already influenced the Jewish culture at this point, the palm branch was a symbol of triumph and victory. And so Jesus was getting ready to triumph, but not like they assumed. So let's look at some of the things that Jesus might have battled on his way, understanding all of this context, what he might have battled on the way to his purpose, and maybe some of the same things that we might just, uh, get distracted from or with. So the first reason why people get distracted from their purpose is that, number one, we live based upon others' expectations of ourselves. You see, people were okay with Jesus being a king as long as he did everything the way they expected their preconceived way see we've got to keep our eyes on our purpose but never assume the journey that'll take you there that's where you get messed up see that's why all these teachers of the law that had they had even memorized the first five books of the bible and all of the prophecies and they had memorized all of this stuff but when jesus showed up and almost daily fulfilled prophecy that was written thousands of years before, they totally missed it because they had preconceived ideas of what the journey would be like and what the Messiah would do. Side note, I don't think it's gonna be any different when the second coming. So be careful how dogmatic, dogmatic you are and how attached you are to prophecy of end times or interpretation of prophecy because Jesus showed up the first time and fulfilled all the prophecy and yet it looked nothing like what the teachers of the law taught so here's the thing is God likes to think outside of our little human boxes he likes to do things that are in unusual, lay, unusual ways with unusual people so sometimes if you feel like you can't get anything right and then everything is going wrong just hang in there keep pursuing God because you might just be on the road that God is using in your life because when we read some of the Bible stories and some of the things that God did in people's lives we have the benefit of knowing the end at the beginning but they had to be seriously confused and sometimes terrified along the way and yet God used them and so as long as you're maintaining your relationship with the Holy Spirit and allowing him to lead you and guide you and prepare your future, then there is a confidence on the inside of you that, listen, everything's gonna be okay as long as you're listening to his voice and obeying his voice and living based upon other people's expectations of you as opposed to the leading of the Holy Spirit and the leading of God's word is always gonna cause you to be distracted from your purpose never live your life based upon what other people believe to be right live it according to the word and what the Holy Spirit speaks to you that lines up with that word Okay, Pastor Steve did an amazing message a couple weeks ago on hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit and so if you missed it you can go back and check it out on our website by the way, he and Pastor Connie are ministering. Uh, are, this morning, they are in Woodbridge, Virginia, and uh, at a church there. And so just be praying for them uh, this morning, but still listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> but we will feel lost in this life if we live our lives based upon what other people, to be, uh, are, what other people think is true for us. If we craft our lives based upon the thoughts and the beliefs and the ideas that were handed down to us from young ages, from our parents, our family members, maybe teachers, friends, society, and everybody that we interacted with, there's a good chance that we might be seriously messed up. 
Because if we never take the time to question the authenticity of those beliefs against what God's word says, then we're going to continue to build and craft and shape our lives based upon what other people believe to be right. And sometimes they were right. But the question is, do you know it to be right by the word of God and the Holy Spirit inside of you? Or are you just going upon what other people told you? Amen? All right. So, sometimes, even though we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, the very trusted and wise counselor on the inside of us, we don't seem to trust ourselves. Sometimes we're constantly seeking advice from other people and opinions from other, other people around us. And we need to do that, but make sure that that's not more valuable than what we value uh, of our own thoughts and our own hearing of the Holy Spirit and our own reading of the word. And so we don't wanna always try to measure up to the expectations of other people around you. That will distract you from your purpose. And Jesus knew that. And in this moment, he totally ignores all of these people and their expectations of him. And he was able to enjoy them and the celebrations of that day, but at the same time, understanding That in the future, when they didn't understand it, he didn't have to live up to their expectations. He only had to live up to the expectations of his heavenly father. So the second thing that can distract us from our purpose is that, number two, we think our purpose is about us. You see, Jesus' purpose was to help people find their purpose. He came to seek and save the lost and then to make them into disciples, to give them purpose. And that is my purpose and it's your purpose as well. No matter what specifically he has called us to do, our purpose is to make disciples. You see, Jesus even said in Matthew 20, he said, just as the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. You see, Jesus was and is the victor, but the only way he came to victory was by the way of his own death. And you and I in our lives are no different. He continually told them that they needed to take up their cross and follow him. And so for us to think that our purpose is for us is folly. You see, God has given each and every one of us different skills and different talents, different relationship, different financial situations, and all of it is for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to serve others. As an individual, my life is not my own. My life was bought with a price for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to bring people to Jesus and to make disciples. And that applies to each and every one of us, no matter what your vocation is. Our marriage is a great example of that. Do you realize that if you are in a marriage because of what you can get out of it, then your marriage is fragile? Contrary to popular and recent marriage ideology, a healthy marriage is two people, listen, that want to be together but don't need to be together. See, when you go into a marriage because of what you need from the other person, it's immediately weaker. But when you go into a marriage because you care and love the other person and you're strong and you have strength and you have something to give to them and you have two people doing this, then you have a healthy, strong marriage. One of the things Melissa coached me early on in our dating relationship was that people think that a relationship is 50-50. But it's not. It's 100-100. It's not I give you 50 and you give me 50. We give each other 100%. So if you're not meeting my needs, needs that day, you had a bad day, I don't back off. I love you regardless with no strings attached. That's what a healthy marriage is. And see, sometimes what we're what we're accomplishing is purposeful just by serving other people even within our marriage so one of the side effects of our 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 super busy look how great my life is social media world is that we do seemingly mundane things every day that serve others and serve and is accomplishing our purpose and we don't even realize it because it's not super big we know that everything that people post on social media is not real we post the best of the best we hide the mundane and the boring yep brushing my teeth (laughs) 
See, it's easy to detach from our purpose when we're trying to measure up to the unrealistic and sometimes even unreal lives of other people that we see. So we've got to be able to connect the dots between the important things, all, although sometimes small, and the bigger purpose of our lives and the lives of our families. So one thing that comes to mind immediately is raising children. Psalms 127 says, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. And sometimes we forget. Parents, our purpose as parents is huge. It's incredibly meaningful that we are raising children like arrows in the hands of a warrior's. That we're not just necessarily trying to protect them from everything, although we should be protecting them. We're not just trying to, to get them to take out the trash, although we should be trying to make sure that they're responsible, as impossible as it is. But we are raising arrows in the kingdom of God. And that is incredibly important. So those of you that are parents, discipling your children by being an amazing example to them is one of the biggest purposes that you'll ever have. And it's other-centered. And it starts with us developing us. Because this is the painful fact about parenting is that we can teach them what we know. But we will reproduce who we are. That's scary sometimes. If we understand that our purpose, that whatever it is, is not about us, but it's about others, the people that are around us, and in this example, our children, it's harder for you to get distracted from your purpose when you realize what, it's not just survival, that you understand that your purpose, whatever, you're, whatever it is, it's not about us, but it's about others, then it'll be harder for us to get distracted. But we gotta realize that it's not, not only is it not about us, but it's not about the big things in life. God says that if you're faithful with little, he will give you much. And sometimes what we don't realize is that the little is the much. See, it's hard to get motivated about the meaningfulness of your purpose when you have a shallow sense of what you're doing and how it contributes to the big picture. So we've got a very small amount of Material that accounts for Jesus' life across the 33 years of, uh, of his life and the, 30, the three and a half years of ministry. But it's almost like, you know, that social media window that we have in other people's lives where we just see the exciting. And you, I can't help but wonder sometimes how many mundane, boring, uneventful days the disciples had with Jesus. But he was just planting seed and planting seed and planting seed. And he knew his purpose at the end of it. I wonder if they knew, I wonder if they knew what he was planting into them on a regular basis. The third reason why we get distracted real quick is that we get distracted by survival. You see, we gotta stay out of survival mode. How many of you know what it's like to be in survival mode? Yeah, me too. So, I, I saw somewhere the other day where somebody said, um, the devil's attacking me. You know what my response to that is? Attack the devil. I hate being on the defensive. And so I end up grabbing the purpose and the vision of the future and focusing on that and not being distracted by what Satan has for me today. By envisioning and seeing what God has for me tomorrow. So here's what I've discovered is that many of us, we discover habits in order to survive in our past. We discovered, we developed these survival techniques in unhealthy situations. But the habits that you created to survive are no longer going to serve you when it's time to push ahead and thrive. They hold you back a lot of times. And so we've got to go back and look at what kind of survival mechanisms have been created on the inside of us from the past and how do we undo that? How do we focus on the future of what God has for us? You see, Jesus was not just trying to survive the ordeal. He had a purpose and a future. And the Bible says that where there is no vision, people perish. And so if I'm just trying to survive, 
the devil's attacks. And I don't have a vision for my purpose in life, then I am going to perish. We are going to perish. So we need a vision and a purpose, just like Jesus had, or we're going to flounder continually. You know, next week is Easter. And statistics say that 50% more, pe- uh, 50% more people go to church on Easter than any other day. And there are people in your world that have to do with your purpose that have, they're wondering where they're going to go to church on Easter. And I want to ask you to invite them. There are invite cards on your chairs that look like this. And as I was saying, our purpose is always about other people. And I want to encourage you to pray and just ask the Holy Spirit, God, who are the other people in my life, at work, on my work route, in my school, that are in my life that may not seem like a big grandiose purpose, but is who you've placed on the in, uh, right in front of me and invite them to Easter this year. I'm gonna be talking about your purpose in life to next week as well. And it's gonna be incredibly meaningful for people. I tell you what, the Bible says that, Paul said that if, we, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, our, our whole life is meaningless. It's all pointless. It's all meaningless. And so we're gonna talk about that next week. And I just wanna encourage you, pray about who you can invite. Don't, don't lose your purpose. Pray about who you can invite next week to, to Easter. So don't live your life based upon what other people expect of you. And understand that our purpose and our calling in life is always about other people. And we'll always mess it up when it starts to be about us and it begins to get selfish. Something that, that we want for ourselves only. And don't get into survival mode. Realize that your purpose is to have victory on the other side of the battle. Keep that vision in front of you and don't let anything or anyone steal it away from you. Jesus made his way through the city streets and through that week and all the way to the cross, to the grave and out of the tomb. And you and I can use that as an example. You and I can use that triumphant entry as an example of how to keep from getting distracted from the purposes that he gave us. Because I want a life where I can be just like him. You see, his purpose was to help other people find their purpose. And that's my purpose. And that's your purpose as well. Because disciples, true disciples, are discipling other disciples. So what would it be like if each and every one of us could stay focused on our purpose of serving others? In the big things and in the mundane things. When things are good and when things are not so good. What if we kept our eyes on the people that God had placed around us to minister to? How much better would our lives be? Would you stand with me? I believe that we each and every one can make a huge impact on the world around us if we just stay focused, if we can keep our eyes on our purpose. Now you might be here and you might be thinking, well, that's great, but I... I don't even have a relationship with God, much less understand his purpose for my life. And so if you're not a believer or you've never made a decision to follow Christ, today is your day. God's drawing people to the kingdom of God right now. He loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And God's purpose for your life is different than the world's plan and purpose for your life. Now, Because of sin, all of us have been separated from God. But Jesus came and he paid the price for your sin with his death on the cross so that you could be free to serve him, free to fulfill your destiny and purpose for him, and free to spend eternity with him. And so what we need to do is make a decision to follow Christ today. You can do that right there where you're standing 
And in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand signifying that you would like to pray a prayer with me right there where you are, repenting for your sins and acknowledging that Jesus is the Lord of your life today, starting today, and asking the Holy Spirit to come in and empower you to be the Christian that the Bible promises you that you can be. Your life could be so much different if God is at the center of your life and the Holy Spirit lives big on the inside of you. So if everybody would close your eyes and bow your head. Maybe you've never done this before. Maybe you never made a decision to follow Christ before. Or maybe you used to follow God, you used to serve him, but you've fallen away from the Lord. And if you went into eternity today, you're not sure what would happen to you. Something's come between you and God. And let me just tell you, today is your day. Today is your day to make a decision to follow Christ. You can pray this prayer with me right there where you are. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, those of you that want to pray this prayer with me, I just want you to raise your hand right there where you're standing. I just want to pray this prayer with you right where you are. Raise your hand right now if that's you and you want to make a decision to follow Christ. Don't leave here without Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Everybody look up at me. We're all Christians. Say this after me. Father, Father. in Jesus' name, name. I thank you that every week at Living Word, Word, people give their lives to Christ. Christ. As we reach out to people, people. and we bring them with us. In Jesus' name, name. Amen. amen. So this week, I just want to challenge you this week to keep your eye on that purpose. Don't don't succumb to the expectations of other people. Just God. Just the Word. And um, And don't just try to survive. Don't just try to live out your life just trying to survive your marriage or survive your parenthood or survive your job. And remember that it's not just about us, that whatever God's called you to do as a business owner or as a minister or as a mom or a dad or whatever it is, it's all about you reaching out to other people. Let's worship.